Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Please do like, share, subscribe, comment, all those good things. They really help for others to find this video. So recently, about two weeks ago, Jordan Peterson had a podcast with Jonathan Pagiao. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, in which they spoke about faith and spoke about the Bible, spoke about specifically Jordan Peterson's own journey. And in that conversation, Jordan Peterson made a few statements that has had a lot of people talking about the question of whether or not he has come to faith in Christ. So I want to examine that a little bit. But before we go there, I want to give you a little bit of a background. So first of all, I first came into contact with Jordan Peterson's work in around 2016, where it was the whole controversy around the, the laws that have been changed in Canada, around gender pronouns. He became um, known at that time for speaking out against that. It wasn't well known. It wasn't um, mainstream news, but um, I got aware of that um, started following a bit of his work. I'm interested in what he was about. He was a professor, obviously, of psychology at the University of Toronto. He still holds that position, but I believe he's um, sort of on the leave of absence. And there was a whole controversy around that. There was a confrontation on the university campus. And from that, he appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast. And after that, several times more. And I became familiar with Jordan Peterson, with his work. But what fascinated me about Jordan Peterson was not the controversy around the political stuff, but really his work in studying the Bible from a perspective of psychology. And he called this series The Psychological Significance of the Bible. And I found this intriguing, fascinating. I enjoyed the way that he approached the Bible because he didn't approach it purely as a myth, as many of his contemporaries in the fields of psychology or in the fields of um, philosophy would do. He approached it very much as a narrative that potentially contains truth um, and to a large extent he, he really did justice in a way to the way that he treated the text and I really appreciated that and I actually drew a lot of insight from the things that he was seeing in the narrative now Jordan Peterson obviously went on from there to become famous for his book 12 rules to life which I think has sold now more than 5 million copies he's also become infamous because he associates with people who are regarded by the woke political crowd as being right wing although I've never heard Jordan Peterson say a single right wing thing in my life but he's branded as right wing because he believes I suppose in personal responsibility and because he associates with some people who have associated with some people who have associated with some people who are potentially right wing and that's how it works nowadays you are guilty by association but i want to just take a moment before we look at his recent confession i want to take a moment to look at some of the things he taught um, from this lecture series now we don't have time to go into numerous lectures i'm going to just pick one which is really my favorite which he did on cain and abel now i didn't watch all of his lectures i watched probably three of them completely and then dipped into a number of others but this is the one i really enjoyed the most and i want you to hear some of the profound things that jordan says and what this illustrates to me is someone um, which is fascinating, someone coming from a perspective of psychology, approaching the Bible from that perspective, studying the Bible really in depth, in an in-depth way, and coming to a deeper and deeper understanding of many biblical truths. And then the question was, for me even then, is where is this going to lead Jordan Peterson? Where is he going to go, um, which will get us to this recent statement that he made? So let's have a listen to some of the things he said in his lecture on Cain and Abel. At the beginning, he's sort of setting up the premise, and then he goes into the particular teachings. Something very similar, but it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. Action comes first. Implicit comes first. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for thousands and thousands of years and we thought it over and we drew a conclusion. The successful among us sacrifice. The successful among us delay gratification. The successful among us bargain with the future. And then a great idea begins to emerge in ever more articulated form. That idea is the point of a long and profound story. It's the moral of the story. And I'm going to engage in some foreshadowing here. What's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. And things get better as the successful practice their sacrifices. The question becomes increasingly precise and simultaneously 
broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice for the greatest possible good? You know, if you, if you push a question in a direction, perhaps there comes a time when you can't formulate it any more precisely and broadly, and, and, and that, 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 that's the point at which the question, in some sense, and perhaps even the answer, the question becomes archetypal. It, it becomes archetypal because it, it can't be bested. And, and this is like an ultimate question in some sense. How are you going to ask a more broad-based question than that? What is, given the initial presuppositions that you have to make sacrifices, then the logical end point to that is something like, okay, if you have to make a sacrifice, what's the greatest possible sacrifice and for the greatest possible good? That's a good question. The answer becomes increasingly profound. The God of Western tradition, like so many gods, requires sacrifice. We've already examined why, but sometimes he goes even further and requires the sacrifice of what is loved best. This is why. And this is another one of mankind's fundamental discoveries. Sometimes things do not go well. That, that's self-evident. But here's the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's precisely that which is most valued that is the cause. Why? It's because the world is revealed through the template of your values. If the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. Now, just to fill in a few of the blanks here in terms of um, what he's talking about, because he does do this lecture over a period of two and a half hours, so it's difficult for me to give you a full picture by showing you a little snippet. But he's talking about the concept of sacrifice, and he's talking about the idea that sacrifice is really a very advanced way of thinking. And, and he brings these two concepts together. He tries to bring together the concept of sacrifice in the world in, in the sense of delayed gratification and the, sac the concept of sacrifice in the Bible, which is obviously sacrifice to a higher being. And he's saying these two things are actually very closely related. It's the belief that giving something up, giving something up now will have benefit in the future. And ultimately, if you drill that thought down far enough, who is it that you're giving this thing up to? And what is the most valuable thing that you can give up? And so he speaks around the psychology of um, sacrifice, the psychology of denial of self, of, of delayed gratification, and how this is true of people who are successful in the world, that those who are successful one of the key determining factors is their ability to delay gratification. And if we are impulsive, if we are just people who want what we want now, we will not be as successful as someone who can delay gratification, work hard, sacrifice, give up things for a future benefit. Now in this next part, he sums up the thinking around sacrifice, both from a humanistic point of view and from a biblical point of view, and then he takes that into the story of Cain and Abel. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. Nothing greater can be imagined. That's why it's an archetype. You can't push past it. So, that's the very definition of archetypal. That's the core of what constitutes religious. The greatest of all possible sacrifices is self and child. Of that, there can be no doubt. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, equally, there can be no doubt. The person who wants to alleviate suffering, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will therefore sacrifice everything he has to God. To life in the truth. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, this is after Adam and Eve have been chased out of the Garden of Eden, right? So, what's really cool about this, I really think that the, Adam, the Cain and Abel story is the most profound story I've ever read, especially given that. It's, you can tell it in 15 seconds. I won't, because <laughs> I tend not to tell stories in 15 seconds, <laughs> as you may have noticed. But, but you can read the whole thing that quickly. And it's so densely packed that I just can't, it's, it's, it's actually unbelievable.
to me that it can be that densely packed. Okay, so the first thing is, is that Adam and Eve are not the first two human beings. Cain and Abel are the first two human beings. Because Adam and Eve were made by God and they were born in paradise. It's like, what kind of human beings are those? You don't know any human beings like that. Human beings aren't born in paradise and made by God. Human beings are born of other human beings, right? And so, so that's the first thing. And it's post-fall. We're out in the world. We're out in history now. We're not in some archetypal beyond, although we are still to some degree, not to the degree that was the case with the story of Adam and Eve. We, we've already been thrown out of the garden. We're already self-conscious. We're already awake. We're already covered. We're already working. We're full-fledged human beings. And so you have the first two human beings, Cain and Abel, prototypical human beings. So what's cool is that humanity enters history at the end of the story of Adam and Eve, and then the archetypal patterns for human behavior are instantaneously presented it's, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And it's not, a great, it's not a very nice story, right? So they're, they're brothers. They're hostile brothers. They've, they've got their, their, their hands around each other's throat, so to speak, or at least th that's the case in one direction. So it's a, it's a story. The first two human beings engage in a fratricidal st struggle that ends in the death of the best one of them. That's the story of human beings in history. And that, man, if that doesn't give you nightmares, you didn't understand the damn story. I absolutely agree with Jordan Peterson that Cain and Abel has often been a story that I've thought of as being archetypal in so many different ways. And when I say story, I mean not story as in myth, but story as in true life events. And they illustrate so much of human nature. They illustrate so much of the interaction between man and God. And one of the most fundamental things to understand when we look at the story of Cain and Abel is that this is not a believer and an unbeliever approaching God. These are two believers who believe in God, who have a relationship with God, and they approach God with their sacrifice. They approach God with something outward that illustrates what's happening within them. The one is accepted and the other is not. And then not just the whole position of not being accepted, but how do you then respond when you're not accepted, when what you've given is not what was asked, what is required? How do you then respond? Do you then blame the world? Do you then blame God? Do you then go into a position of self-pity and, and, um, you know, curse the world or curse God. And this is the, the issue that um, Jordan Peterson brings out so powerfully in these lectures is that from a psychological perspective, he, the point he makes from a psychological perspective is this, that even if you are the victim, even if you are the victim in your story, there is no psychological benefit in playing the victim. There's no benefit to be derived from playing the victim, cursing God, saying, woe is me, you know, going into a heap of pity. There's no benefit because you will not do anything beneficial out of that position. So no matter how much you are the victim, it is your response to your circumstances. It's your response to the hand that you've been dealt. That is what is absolutely key from a psychological perspective, from your own mind, psyche, approach to life. And I think this is what made Jordan Peterson so popular because it speaks to what I think many of us believe is so important and that is responsibility, human responsibility. And it's one of the things I speak about a lot on this channel because there are those in the world who want to reject human responsibility, want to make it all about what has happened to you and not what you can actually do for yourself. And there is also theology out there. There is predominant streams of theology that teach that you have no actual responsibility. It's God who does everything. It's really not about what you do. It's just about what happens to you. And that's fatalism. And these ways of thinking are so damaging to um, the human psyche. And so I love this about how Jordan Peterson brings this out in his lecture series. Now let's listen to what he says about the concept of sacrifice in the Bible. This is fascinating. The fact that this book that sets, sits at the cornerstone of our culture would present the first man as a murderer of his brother is something that should really set you back on your heels. And again, she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
There you see a very old representation. There's Abel there, and he's got his sheep up on the altar, and Cain is bringing a sheaf of wheat, and I don't know exactly what's happening here with the blood, but, or it's a ray, perhaps, it's something like that, but the overall impression of the image is that something transcendent is communicating with this sacrifice. And you see, that's a, you think, oh, how primitive, you know, how primitive these people were sacrificing to their God. It's like, you know, those people weren't stupid. And this is not primitive. Whatever it is, it's not primitive. It's sophisticated beyond belief because the idea, as I already pointed out, is that you could sacrifice something of value and that that would have transcendent utility. And that is by no means an unsophisticated idea. In fact, it might be the greatest idea that human beings ever came up with. It's an answer to the problem that's put forward in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Because we became self-conscious and then we discovered the future and then we knew we were going to die and then we knew we were vulnerable and then we became ashamed and then we developed the knowledge of good and evil and then we got thrown out of paradise. It's like, that's a big problem. So what the hell are you going to do about it? Well, sacrifice, that's the hypothesis. Well, that's a hell of a hypothesis, man. That's what we're doing. You made plenty of sacrifices, even to sit in this theater and many people made plenty of sacrifices to have a theater like this exist. And many people made sacrifices so that we could actually freely engage in the dialogue that we're engaging in, in a theater like this. And so it's like all of this is built on sacrifice and sacrifice bloody well better work because we do not have a better idea. Sacrifice, what's the counter position? Murder and theft. So let's go with sacrifice, shall we? And perhaps we won't consider it so damn primitive no, because it's not so primitive. So in a nutshell, what Jordan is saying here is that a successful, a healthy society is built upon sacrifice. Because either I give up something for the benefit of my children, of society, of those around me. Either I give something up in order to make life better for the whole. Or I revert to a life whereby I just think about myself and then I will revert to violence, to um, any way that I can get for myself, benefit myself at the expense of the other. Now in this next section, he's going to look at the story of Cain and Abel from the perspective of two different kinds of people. And he uses an illustration of people that he knew. One, a, a gentleman who he had tried to help who was very destitute. And the other, um, some students that they used to have in their home that were some of the top students in the world. And he just contrasts these two kinds of people and then listen to the conclusion he makes at the end of that. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Now that's an interesting line. Because and I've looked at a variety of different translations of this, this seventh verse here. Like a bunch of them. Because... The translation for that, that's a critical line, and the translation really matters. And so I'll tell you what I think the story is, what I've been able to figure out. And I'm sure I haven't got it completely right, but it's... So he asks, the, the God says to him, if you do well, won't you be accepted? Well, there's a hint there, right? It's something like, well, things aren't going so well for you. So th the first thing you might think is, you're not doing well. Well, does that mean you're not doing good? Does that not mean you're not acting properly? It means it's the hint, because God is suggesting that if you were doing it properly, you would be successful. I had a friend at one point who was a very bitter person, and he had a bunch of problems, and some of them were self-inflicted, and some of them were fate, I suppose. And, he had, he, was, he had become very, very destructive, murderously destructive, genocidally destructive, I would say. You could see it in his dreams. And, and he lived with me for a while. And uh, I knew him very well. He was a friend of mine from the time I was 12 until the time he committed suicide when he was about 40. And uh, when he lived with me, I was trying to help him get on his feet, which was why he had come to live with me, because he thought maybe I could help him get on his feet. And he could only take relatively low-level jobs, you know, like 
he had some mechanical ability. He didn't, he didn't get educated, although he's a very, very smart person. He probably had an IQ of about 135 or something like that. He was very smart. And so he was bitter, too, because he hadn't educated himself to the level that his, edu you know, his intellect would have demanded. So he had to take jobs that were beneath him intellectually. And he had, a re he had that real intellectual arrogance, you know, because he was smart. And really smart people often come to believe that only smart matters, and if they're smart, and all that and all that matters is smart, and then the world isn't sort of laying itself at their feet, then they've been terribly betrayed. And, and then they cling to their intelligence, which is more like a talent or a gift, like it's, a, like it's an idol, you know, a false idol, which is exactly what it is, and a very dangerous one, and get cynical about the stupidity of the world and the fact that their talents weren't properly recognized. And that's just not that helpful, you know, because smart is a good thing, but I'll tell you, if you don't use it properly, it will devour you, just like all arbitrarily assigned talents, right? So you might have a talent, but it's your friend. If you use it properly and if you misuse it, it will be your enemy. And maybe that's how God keeps the cosmic scales adjusted. Dramatic ability, or they were musicians, or they'd done some spectacular charitable work. Because you basically, to get accepted into Harvard, you had to be top of your damn school and then you had to have at least two other outstanding things going for you, you know? And what was so annoying about most of these kids, this was our joke, was you really both liked them and respected them. It's like, we, we, my joke was, you'd think they would have had the good graces to be like dislikable sons of bitches, at least, with all, the, all those other great things going for them, they had to add like respectability and likability to it as well. So you thought, well, you know, it really couldn't happen to a better person. It's like, good God. Well, that's, that's, that's Abel's situation, you know. It's like, and you know, the funny thing too is that that's an ideal. That's the ideal, right? Because an ideal person, let's say, would be someone who you would want to be like and, and someone who is operating in the world like you would want to operate and someone whom fortune was smiling on and someone who was making the right sacrifices. It's really what you would want to be. And so Cain kills that. Right, so it's a psychological story too. And you see this in the cynicism that people have about people who have done well in the world. They're always looking for some reason why they've done well. They must be crooked or they must be, they must be conniving or they must be arrogant or they must be psychopathic. Or, and, oh, and of course, all of those things exist. But it's a very bad trick to play on yourself to make the proposition that the person in the world who re represents your own ideal is that ideal because of despicable reasons. Because what you do is train yourself that the ideal that you should pursue can only exist if it's motivated by despicable reasons. And then what? Not only is Abel, your brother, dead as your brother in the field, in reality, but you've also slaughtered your own ideal. Well, then what the hell are you going to work for? Well, how are you going to live then? Now, this statement is so profound on so many levels because I see this playing out in our culture, in our society, that we are always wanting to bring down, pull down those who are doing well. We always want to find excuses for why they are doing well and why I am not. We always want to position blame somewhere. We always want to um, have jealousy towards them. We, we eventually want to kill them. If we have the opportunity to destroy them, to kill them as Cain does Abel, then we do that. We try and undermine them. We try and destroy their reputation. We try and find some way to cancel them. This is the predominant way that the world is working today. And it is, it is so incredibly clearly played out in the story of Cain and Abel. This story of Cain and Abel is our story. It's the story of mankind. It is your story and it is my story. And I find that often I am in psychologically I am, find myself in the position of Cain rather than Abel. I find myself in the position where I want to be jealous. I want to judge. I want to blame. I want to say it's someone else's fault. I want to curse God. I can find myself so easily, my human nature can so easily go to that place. And so this is why this story is so profound and why I so appreciate the way that Jordan Peterson unpacks this from a psychological perspective. And what this illustrates for me as well is that he is on a journey of discovering that the Bible, and I think he says this a number of times, is really a profound book of describing what this world really is like. 
And if you were willing to take the time to study the Bible the way that he has, and I don't, there's many Christians who don't study the Bible as seriously as Jordan Peterson has. If you take the time to study the Bible, you will actually find that it is truly worth more than gold. You know, I love watching Gold Rush. I love all the different variants of it. And I just recently was watching again some Gold Rush, the normal show, and then the one where they, um, in the white water, they, you know, dredging in these rivers in, in Alaska or in Canada. I'm not sure exactly where they are. And uh, these guys give up everything and they sacrifice everything and they put their lives in incredible danger to find some little nugget of gold under a rock somewhere in this icy cold river. And I just think to myself, I could see myself doing that. It looks kind of exciting. It looks enticing. But but really, what do, what do I think about the Word of God? Do I understand that the Word of God is like that? The Word of God is far more valuable even than that. And so this is what, for me, is fascinating about Jordan Peterson, about what he has taught. And I encourage you to go and watch any of his lectures. They're all excellent. Um, look, he swears in them, and he, he doesn't necessarily make points that I think I agree with. But there's some nuggets of truth. There's some gold. Um, in these statements. But that brings us to his recent statement that a lot of people have been speaking about. So let's watch this interaction between himself and Jonathan Pagow. I hope I pronounce his name right. And this interaction between them and the statement that Jordan Peterson makes around the idea of the story, the myth of Christ and the objective truth of reality, how these things touch in Christ. He's speaking obviously from a perspective of psychology and from philosophy and how what he thinks of this idea. But the thing is, is the deeper you go into biology, the more it shades into something that appears to be religious because you start analyzing the fundamental structure of the psyche itself. And, and it becomes something... Well, it be becomes something with a, with, with, a, with, a, with, with a power that transcends your ability to resist it. Hmm. So, okay, so you can think about Christ from a psychological perspective, and the, the, criti the critic, my critic, this particular critic that I've been reading, said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And, of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of, there's a historical representation of his, of, of his existence as well. Now you can debate whether or not that's genuine. You can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this, well, it does, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth. And in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen... Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch, you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real, like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world, but the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and and let's say the narrative make meet, let's both. Say. I yeah. think I think you because when you believe that you buy both those stories, you believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch. 
So clearly there, you have the statement of a man, as you can see, visibly emotional, a statement of a man who is wrestling with these deep and profound truths. And it's brought many people to say, oh, maybe Jordan Peterson is a believer. Maybe this is a statement of faith. And I think there's definitely a journey here. I think, as I've said, this journey has been a long journey for him. And I think there is a journey of discovery. And I think he's going deeper and deeper in this journey of discovery. And I find it fascinating how someone is on this journey from a perspective of psychology and philosophy, how that is their approach, but they're studying the Bible and they are uncovering these multiple levels of truth um, that they'd not seen before, um, specifically in the Bible. However, I want us to go to a, a later statement that Jordan Peterson makes. So let's watch this, this later statement where they speak specifically about the incarnation of Christ. And just listen to what Jordan has to say in this statement. And so what happens in something like the story of Christ is that that gets taken into one person. And so all the opposites become the king and the, 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 the criminal, the, you know, the highest, even in the image of the cross, you have this image. And the, it, as Christ is being crucified, they're putting a sign above his head saying that he's the king. As Christ is being beaten, they're giving to him a crown. And so Christ joins together all the opposites. And so in his, in his story, you see, if, you, if you're attentive to these patterns, you see the highest form of this pattern being played out. And one of the aspects that has to be there for it to be the most revealed or highest form is that it also has to include the world of manifestation. I mean, it can't just be a story. It has to be connected to the world. So that's why Christians insist on the, the, the fact that Jesus is not just a story, that he's an incarnated man, that he was incarnated. But I don't because... believe their insistence. I don't believe, that, well, this is, this is, because I don't, it isn't obvious to me, and I think maybe I derived this criticism from Nietzsche, but you know, people have asked me whether or not I believe in God, and I've answered in various ways. No, but I'm afraid he probably exists. That's, that's one answer. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I'm terrified he might exist. That that would be a truthful answer to some degree, or a, that I act as if God exists. So notice in that statement that they're talking about the incarnation, and Jordan Peterson stops short of saying that Jesus is really incarnate, God incarnate. And herein lies a powerful connection between the principle of sacrifice that he discussed in his lecture and this whole concept of the identity of Christ, because the sacrifice of Christ has no real value apart from his identity. It is who Christ is that makes the sacrifice valuable, that makes it effective, that makes it possible for everything else to come out of that one sacrifice. And this is important because this is really fundamental to our faith. And so if you had to ask me, is Jordan Peterson come to believe in Christ? I would say he's on a journey. He's on a journey of discovery, but I don't think he's yet come to fully know who Christ is. And this is important because there are many of us who emphasize the gospel of justification, who emphasize that it's about what Christ did, and that's believing what Christ did that's important. But that's not really the central point of the gospel. And on this channel, I often speak about the gospel of the kingdom of God. Because it's important to know that the gospel Jesus preached was about a kingdom. And the most important part of that gospel, of that message of the kingdom, is who is the king. And that is crucial for understanding and believing the gospel and accepting the gospel message. And so I'll just make mention of um, two scriptures here quickly. The first is from 1 John 4 verse 2, which says, By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. It is absolutely central to our faith to know that Jesus is come from God. He is of God, son of God, of the same substance as God, but he has come in the flesh. He is man. That these two realities are absolutely central because it's not that important. Or let me not say it's not that important. Let me rephrase that. Um, it's irrelevant what Jesus did, his death, his resurrection, what he taught, his ascension, all of those things become completely irrelevant apart from his nature, apart from who he is. And so this is the question that Jesus asked the disciples. 
Which brings us to our second scripture, which is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Now, we don't have time to unpack all of this. I think I have done this in previous videos. Um, or if you go to the God story series, you'll see a full description of this. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Notice that he's conflating these two things. He says the son of man, which is the predominant idea of this figure, which comes from Daniel chapter um, 13, Daniel chapter 7, and this picture of the son of man. Who is the son of man? And now he says, who do you say I am? And here, look what, what Peter says. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Here, Peter makes this confession. You are the Christ which is the Messiah, the one who has come to save mankind, the man who comes to save God's people. That is the picture of the Messiah. And you are the son of the living God, of the same substance as God. And so in this confession, Peter knows and declares who Jesus truly is. And Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, and on this rock, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And that, that's obviously the classic statement where the Catholic Church says, oh, it's built on Peter. But if you look at the Greek, it's very clear that he's not referring to Peter in the masculine. He's referring to the rock, which is the statement. And he's saying, on the statement that you made, Peter, on that I'm building my church. The statement is, who is Jesus? That is the central point of the Christian faith. And so... So I believe we need to be praying for Jordan Peterson that he will see this truth, that he will, will understand this truth, that God will reveal this to him. Just as I pray that God will reveal this to everyone um, in the world um, and that this is the center point. This should be the center point of the gospel message that we preach. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. There is a kingdom into which God wants to bring people. How do you come into this kingdom? By knowing who the king is. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. And when you know who Jesus is, when you understand that he is fully God and fully man, this shapes and changes absolutely everything about the way that you live. Every single aspect of life. And it's difficult to, to expand on that fully in a short statement now. But absolutely every aspect of your life pivots, shapes, on this belief, on knowing who Jesus is, that he is both fully God and that he is both fully man. These two things, this nature of Jesus is the most important thing that every single Christian needs to know and which is the basis of faith. So let's understand the gospel of the kingdom. Let's understand what is central to this message. And let's preach that message. And let's pray for people like Jordan Peterson to come to believe this message about who Jesus is. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Please do like, subscribe, share, comment, all those good things. And I will see you guys next time.